Amen. All right. Of course, tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 8 in our weekly Bible study. Uh, we end in, ended in Genesis chapter number 7. The Bible story uh, stopped right there after 40 days, 40 nights, where the floods were upon the earth. And then it also tells you at the end of verse 24, it says, And the waters prevailed upon the earth, it says, in 150 days. Now that's going to become very relevant here in just a moment to the timeline while Noah was on the ark. Now pick up there in verse number 1. We're going to jump right into chapter number 8, verse number 1. It says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. There's a couple of things I want to point out before we go any further. In verse number 1 here, number 1, I think I may have actually mentioned this in a previous sermon, possibly chapter number seven, but I like those words right there. Those are comforting words where the Bible says, and God remembered Noah. Those are comforting words, just to know that God remembers you, and especially in a situation like this, where this pictures salvation. This is not spiritual salvation, but it pictures salvation. And as I had preached last week or two weeks ago when we were in Genesis chapter number seven, that when God shut that door, that was a picture of eternal security. Man. Noah wasn't getting out of that ark even if he wanted to. It didn't matter what sins Noah committed while he was on that ark. He wasn't leaving that ark. God shut the ark and Noah was making it safe. Just like we, the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. That's until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit seals us. And we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. But right here it says in verse number one, and God remembered Noah. Now, also let me say this. This isn't literally speaking in the sense of, of God's you know, uh, cognitive mind, if you will. The Bible says that his thoughts are not as our, thought, our thoughts. God didn't literally you know, remember Noah like he forgot about Noah. Like, oh crap, I got that guy Noah down there on a boat somewhere. I need to go save that guy. That's obviously not what's literally going on here. When it says God remembered Noah, it's referring to the fact that God is being faithful to Noah. He's being faithful to his promise. God remembered Noah saying that God is going to come through on his part of the deal. Because it actually explains to you what it means by that. It says, and God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. So notice... It's saying when he, that by him remembering Noah, it's him taking action and showing that he put them on that ark and he's going to take care of them going forward, right? So that's what it means when it says God remembered Noah. Now, I want to point out something at the very end of this verse. is a, a word that we don't commonly use. We really never use today. And that is the word, the, the word assuaged. So let's le read that very last clause in that verse, beginning with uh, and, the word and, after the colon there. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. Now, have you ever heard that word used outside of reading the Bible or someone preaching the Bible? Never have, right? Well, I looked it up today, and the word is actually, uh, it's, it's considered an archaic word, right? It's obsolete. It's no longer used. And actually, the form that it would, would still be in use, if you were to facilitate this word, the, the W would be changed into a U. It would be assuaged in that sense. And that's common in our language. W's and U's go back and forth. And they both make the same sound. If you put a, a U there, it's assuaged still. It's still the exact same enunciation. But you don't need to know that word. And that's the point that I want to demonstrate to you right now. Because the Bible defines it for you. You don't need to know it before you come to the Bible. This is a, a perfect example. This is actually an example that I showed my daughter one time when I was explaining to her the concept of how the Bible defines words for you. So look here at the end, verse number one, where it says again, and the waters assuaged, right? Well, I want you to look at verse number two, the very end. The same concept is being de described about the rain. It says, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Look at verse number three, the very end. It says, the waters were abated. Look at verse number five. It says in the very beginning, and the waters decreased. You noticing a pattern here? Look at verse number 8. It says again, also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated. Now, if you don't know what abated means, and if you don't know what, you know, uh, what is another difficult word that we could use? Assuaged. I'm sure that you know what decreased and returned means. And you know, all it means is this, to lessen. 
That's all the concept that's being put forth. But the Bible does this constantly where it will define itself. So if there, if there is a difficult word in the context, 99% of the time it will define itself. But if there's a difficult word in the Bible, I'm sure that you can ultimately find the answer. The Bible is a built-in dictionary. You don't need to even go back. People, you know, uh, lift up Noah's we Noah Webster's uh, 1828 dictionary, which I've referred to that before. But you don't ne you don't need that. That's not essential to reading the Bible. You can go to the Bible, and God has put everything that you need in here for you to understand it. You know what? It's important to grow in knowledge. It's important to become a smarter person. You don't need to be stupid your whole life. The book of Proverbs talks about being a wise man. It talks about the virtue of being wise. And people like to boast in their ignorance. There's nothing funny about that, about being stupid, about being a dumb person. There's nothing cool about that. There's nothing funny about that. I don't want to be stupid. God doesn't want you to be stupid. This right here is wisdom. You have no excuse to be dumb. You have no excuse to be stupid, a stupid person. The Bible encourages people to be wise. That the whole book of Proverbs is meant to give wisdom unto the young man. To give wisdom to anyone. It's, it, you know, all, it's, uh, it's uh, profitable for doctrine for everything. The whole Bible is to learn you know, all different types of knowledge. And as Christians, we shouldn't be these types of people that are ignorant. You know, a lot of Christianity has that, uh, you know, that, that stereotype, if you will. And that's not a good stereotype to have, where you just boast in being stupid. That's not a good stereotype. We should be intelligent as Christians. We should be smart as Christians. We should be wise as Christians. You know, and I'm not on your side in, in the sense to say, oh, you know, we're just, you know, we're just a bunch of dumb Christians. We're just a bunch of dumb southern hillbillies. Because that, oftentimes, they think of the Bible Belt, and you have a bunch of people, you know, in the South that do kind of carry that stereotype. But I'm not in that category. I want to be intelligent. I want to learn the Bible. I want to grow in wisdom. I want to be, I want to look at the types of people in the Bible and be like them. Right. I want to be intelligent, like Solomon. I want to be like David. I want to be like Moses. I want to be like Joseph and Daniel. These are wise men where they're brought in because they know so, so much. They're great men and they're brought before the leaders. They're brought before Pharaoh. They're brought before Nebuchadnezzar because of their great wisdom and their great knowledge. How much do these other Christians have in common with, you know, Solomon and all of these people? Nothing. That's the time. We need to strive to be the Christians of the Bible. We need to strive to learn things. So if you're like, I don't know that word, I just skip it. That's not the right attitude. Learn what the word means. And if you studied your Bible more, you'd, you would figure out, excuse me, this method. And you would see that the Bible defines itself. So don't gloat or boast in ignorance Push yourself and try to grow forward in wisdom and learn more. Amen. So assuage means to lessen or to decrease. It means you know, to be abated, right? For something to abate, to lessen. So that's the concept there. God sent a, a strong wind to pass over the earth, and it says, And the waters were assuaged, so the waters lessened or they decreased. Look at verse number 2. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters, excuse me, return from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Now, this is another, uh, this is a, the, the literary style of the Bible. That the Bible will tell a story two times. It will give you a rundown or it will give you one, one angle of a story and then it will repeat it with another angle. Now, what we read in chapter number 7, it actually told us the same thing. You have 40 days and 40 nights of a flood, and then you have uh, you know, the waters prevailing for 150 days. We have the same thing going on here. God actually remembered Noah, that statement or that verse, after the 40 days and the 40 nights. And then at that point, he sends the great wind. Because the wind is on the earth for 150 days, if you read verse 3. Carefully, that's what it's explaining because the purpose of the wind is to dry up the earth. Look at verse 3 again. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. Now, why were they returning? Remember, they assuaged or they decreased because God sent the wind. That was what was causing the, the waters to be abated, if you will. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And then it says, and after the end of the 150 days, the waters were Abated. Now, abated is a word to say that they were, that, that's, that's a, a more of a closing word, that they were lessened to the point where it was done, like an abatement, right, if you're familiar with that term. 
So that's what that's saying. So the, the 40 days and 40 nights, God remembers Noah. God sends the strong wind. <clears throat> and then at that point, it begins to dry up the earth or to abate the water at that point. Look at verse number four. And then it says this. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Verse five. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. So they continued de decreasing Throughout this period of time, you have the 40 days and 40 nights, 150 days after that while the waters are being decreased. You also have, if you add up the days, you have about two months that goes by because you have the 150 days. Then you have, yeah, an, an additional two months because that's five months. Then you have an additional two months before the ark rests. Because there's 150 days while, it's, while God is sending this strong wind and it's being abated. Now, the 150 days is five months, of course, 30 times five. And then it says that they rested in the seventh month. So they just coasted around, basically, for another two months until they found a place of higher ground, of course, where the ark would, would ultimately rest. And it tells you in the mountains of Ararat. A lot of people would always, they, they misquote this. And even, uh, even uh, you know, people that were searching for the ark, right, they, they, would, they would look in the mountain of Ararat. But it doesn't say specifically the mountain of Ararat. It says the mountains of Ararat, so it's one of the mountains. And I believe Ron Wyatt discovered the ark, by the way. Yeah, I think, I'm serious. Can I get an amen? Has anybody ever seen that? Yeah, look up, Ron, on YouTube, look up Ron Wyatt, Noah's Ark. That guy discovered the ark. It's the same dimensions, almost to a T, but the dimensions are just slightly off, and they're off in accordance with if they were the right dimensions, and then it dilapidated, and it, and it sunk in and fell. They're just barely off. And, and it, you, you know how many uh, uh, floors there were? Do you know how many floors there was in the ark? Three. Three, three stories. There's three. He, they, they went through and they scanned it. <laughs> and there's three stories in this particular you know, uh, structure. Uh, and then uh, they, have, they, you know, he, he, they went through and they found all these rivets in it. And they also they took, a, they took a sampling and they sent it into a lab. This is cool. And there was a tar-like substance all over the outside of it. You know what the Bible says that, that he sealed it with? He put on the outside with pitch. That's like a slime tar. I'm convinced. You know, you need to watch it for yourself so that you can be persuaded. But I'm fully persuaded that it's the, that it's the, it's the uh, that was a Bible, you know, pun there. You need, it. you need to read the Bible more. No, I'm just kidding. Look at verse number uh, six. Uh, yeah, verse number six. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. So this going back again to the to the, uh, the the forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven. No, this would be after they rested. I'm sorry, this would be after they rested because I did this timeline earlier. Yeah, this is after it rested. There's an additional forty days. I apologize for the confusion. It says the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. So he sent forth a raven out of the window. To go to and fro, it says, until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Look at verse 8. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. Verse 9. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. For the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Now, I thought about this a little bit, and I, the only thing that I can come up with, and, and I'll tell you further, why did he send the, the raven first and then the doves? And really, the only distinction between those two animals, you know, would be like their diets, right? The type of animal that they are, one is a more like rougher, tough animal that is a scavenger, the raven, that, that can survive in more harsh more of a harsh type of, of uh, environment, right? And then the dove is more of a pristine uh, uh, bird. It's, it's far from being a scavenger, right? That's really the only distinction between the two. So the only thing that I can really come up with is, you know, the raven, like I said, is a scavenger. So there's going to be dead bodies still floating around. There's going to be things like that floating around and stuff like that. So it, it, the, the reasoning for him sending out the raven first would be because of the types of foods that would be available, that would tell him what is, what is available out there. And, and that kind of gives him an idea of how far the waters have been abated. When he looks around, what are the odds that he's going to see a high mountain? What's the odds that he's going to see something, you know, uh, the, the ground? You know, very slim during this period of time before he actually rests on a mountain. 
So he sends out the raven, and the raven's going to go out and, and search for a different type of food than the doves would. So it wouldn't make sense to send the dove first, then the raven, because the raven would find food before the dove would. Does everyone, everyone understand what I'm saying? So he sends out the dove first and waits for the dove to just not return anymore. And then afterwards he sends out, now we're going to do, oh, I'm sorry, the raven first, send, sends out the raven first and waits for the raven just to not return anymore. And then once the raven no longer comes back, then he sends out the dove. And then once the dove no longer comes back, then he knows, well, now it's time because he knows the diet of a dove. Look, at, uh, look there at verse number 10. We'll keep reading and see what happens with the dove. And he stayed yet other seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from all the earth. So notice that the dove brought back something specific that the raven obviously didn't bring back. Right? You see the difference in their diets and why they serve two different purposes. Why the raven needed to go out first and the dove afterwards. Notice an olive leaf was plucked off. It says, so Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So they're, he's able to access, you know, there's growth now of greenery. The olive trees are obviously growing. So that tells him, you know, a bird obviously being set free can fly throughout <laughs> the sky and, and look down from a bird's eye view and then finally, you know, uh, uh, discover some food, right? And then bring it back to him as it did here. Look at verse number 12. And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove. Then it says this, which returned not again unto him anymore. Now, what does that mean? It means that, that there was enough food, there was enough you know, sustenance for the bird, the dove, to survive on its own. It didn't need to come, keep coming back to Noah there. It was able to survive on its own at this point. So then that tells Noah, look at verse 13, and it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. That's what that told Noah at that point. It says that Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So he obviously, it's interesting, he obviously wasn't able to see that because he's just letting it go out of the window. Like I said, he was sealed in here. He was closed in here. So all he's doing is letting this bird go out of a window, a hole that's in the top, and all he can see is the sky. He can't even look down and see the waters. It says right there, behold, the face of the ground was dry. So once he gets out there, then he's like, oh, it is dry. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's not even able to look at that. Look at verse 14. And in the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, that's, that's the 27th day, of course, day of the month was the earth dry. Now that equals a total of 14 months and 27 days if you want to do the math on your own. Look at verse 15. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. I don't know if you ever thought about this or not, but I'm assuming, I mean, it would just make sense because it tells you two by two, the, that the, uh, the dove and the raven, they were let loose and they didn't come back. So he's only, at this point when he's letting all the animals go, there's only one dove and one raven at this point being released. So they had to find each other and multiply, if you think about that for a few minutes there again. It doesn't talk about him having an extra dove and an extra raven, right? Uh, look there again at, uh, look at verse 16. I pointed this out last time uh, when we were in uh, chapter number 6. Uh, I pointed this out, but it says, go forth of the ark. Now, when we looked in verse, in chapter number 6, when, when Noah's actually, or chapter number 7, when Noah's getting into the ark, God says, come. Here we see that God says, go. And, uh, and both of these verbs are, are from the, the, the perspective of God himself being in the ark. God was in the ark when Noah was not, and God said, come into the ark. You have to be in the ark. Then God being in the ark with Noah, he tells Noah, go forth. Go forth of the ark. So that, again, is a comforting thing, as I pointed out last time. Look there in verse number 18. It says, and Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. Verse 20, And Noah builded an altar 
unto the Lord. Now, we would normally say built there, of course, right? And you see the difference in the Bible's language. Also, like when you saw plucked, the olive leaf plucked, you know, spelled with a T, right? You know, obviously we would put an E-D there now. But it's the same thing, of course. It says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 12. I want to make a spiritual application here quickly. Romans chapter number 12. Now, as I've mentioned many times, and uh, I've shown you these parallels, that the Bible actually draws symbolism between Noah's Ark and salvation. The Bible actually draws symbolism between, uh, you know, our, the salvation of our souls, not just he was saved physically, but it, he, the Bible actually draws a parallel and, may, and, and, uh, and creates a symbolism between Noah being saved physically and then our souls being saved spiritually from hell. And what's interesting is that Noah, he's, you know, he's saved physically, right? Which pictures our salvation spiritually, as I said. He gets off the ark. He makes it there safe, right? And what does he do immediately? And immediately he makes an offering, right? Now, let's, you know, look around at the majority of people that get saved. When they get saved, is that what they do immediately? No. no. How rare is that? Or they want to come to the they want to come to the church and make an offering. I mean, very rare. Where you go to somebody's door, you knock on their door, you preach them the gospel, and sometimes they're extremely excited. And you're like, man, they're coming for sure. How many times have you said that? Who said that over 10 times? <laughs> Who said it over 20 times? <laughs> I could keep going, right? Yeah. Tons of times, because they're so excited, right? And they're so vehement. And you're like, man, they're ready to make an offering. They're ready to sacrifice. But then the zeal just goes away. It just dwindles away, right? But we, it doesn't matter how long you're saved, you need to still be willing to give that offering. It doesn't matter how many years go by, you need to still be ready at any time to build an altar and to make an offering unto God. And the reason why is because of the great mercies that God bestows upon you. You forget about what you're saved from. From an eternal fire that's never quenched, being just burning forever. And you say, how long? Forever. How long? A billion years? Still not there. Another billion? Still not there. Not even close. It's not even, you can't even say it's a drop in the bucket because there is no such thing as time. It's, in, it's infinity. Just ask yourself the question. When you die, how long are you going to be dead? Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's never ending. Ever. You're never coming back. You're never getting another opportunity. Ever. So, so now, those that are saved, look at it from a perspective of, man, because when, when you put yourself into the position of the unsaved person, that can be scary. When you start really thinking about hell. Now you know what you need to do? You need to be thankful that you're saved from that. You need to be thankful that God saved your soul from that. Just like God saved Noah physically, God saved you from a much worse damnation than drowning in water. Much worse damnation than just drowning and suffocating you know, within water. Much worse. That's temporary. So you need to be thankful. You need to be willing to sacrifice. Look at chapter number 12 here in Romans. Romans. Look at verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that means I beg you, by the mercies of God. So notice what he says, I'm begging you by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now notice what he says, I'm beseeching you, I'm begging you by the mercies of God. Now think about the mercy of God. The mercy of God is, is, is by which you are saved. That's what you're saved by. You're saved by God's grace or God's mercy. God bestowing his mercy and his grace upon you, the very least that you could do is sacrifice the rest of your life. God doesn't want you. you know, the New Testament, they're done away with sacrifices. The sacrifice that Noah made, we're not doing them anymore. God, would, it's not acceptable. You know what is acceptable? Your body. You know what is acceptable? Your life. Like this says right here, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Holy, you know, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now notice what it said, which is your reasonable service. You know, 
You're like, man, Noah really loved God. He was willing to just sacrifice, you know, this animal. He was willing to, you know, to take all these animals, build this altar, put all of this effort into that. That was his reasonable service for what God did for him. Right. He deserved to die in that flood just like you deserve to die and go to hell. Right. And if you right now sacrifice the rest of your life, 12 hours a day, soul winning, serving God, reading your Bible, praying, that's nothing special. That's your reasonable service. God is not impressed with your works right. at all. God would not look down and say, man, you're a hard worker. That's your reasonable service for what God did for you. Amen. God came down to this earth and left glory and died and suffered on the cross and took your punishment and then went down to hell and took your punishment in hell. And you say, man, I've done a lot for him. You've done squat for him. He's not impressed. Now, here's the thing. God will reward us and God will deal with us on a humanly level. But God does not look at your works and say, wow. That's your reasonable service. Right. That's just you doing what is reasonable. Just read. That's what God says. This is inspired, right? This is God speaking through Paul. He says that's your reasonable service. Do you know what you should do the rest of your life? Build an altar and sacrifice to God. Why? Because he saved you. Because he saved you. Just like Noah was saved, you know what you should do? You know what you should do tomorrow? Build an altar and read your Bible. Build an altar and go soul winning. Build an altar and pray. Build an altar and follow God's commandments. Sacrifice to God. Build an altar and do that which God wants you to do. And he commands you to do. Keep the commandments of God. Continually build an altar and sacrifice to God. That's what you need to do. See, here's the thing. You know, you know God, you know, uh, he's the one that preserved Noah. He's the one that, 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 that saved Noah, right? Here. What, and what we saw, you know, the, which would be a picture of salvation. You know, and the only thing that, 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 is, that is technically just free, we don't have to, not technically, you know, it is in every sense, literally. The only thing that's free where we do no works at all is salvation. Right. That's the only thing. Right. The only thing, I want you to go back and let's look at something real quick in Genesis chapter number 8. The only thing that we do no works at all for is salvation. But every other aspect of the Christian life, it's work. It's Amen. work. You need to be working. Amen. In every area of the Christian life, it's not just fun, it's work. Right. You know what you see the people in the Bible doing constantly? Working. All the time. Every one of them. You know what Noah had to do? He had to build an ark. A massive, just huge ark. God did not build that ark. Noah built that ark. God gave him the instructions to build the ark, and Noah built the ark. Amen. God commanded him to build the ark, and Noah built the ark. God did not build that altar. Noah built the altar. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to look here in Genesis chapter number 8. Look at what it says in verse number 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now notice here, it says, and Noah built an altar. We've been putting a lot of emphasis on building the church, right? And I've preached on this, uh, you know, a, a few other times. But here's the thing. It's hard work to build the church. I don't want people in here, you know, being discouraged about, you know, you know the, the lack of visitors. Of course, we have a visitor tonight. Hopefully, Hope stays and, be, and continues to be a part of our church here. But the, here's the thing. You know, like we were just talking about a minute ago, how many people sacrifice after they get saved? Very, very few. So of the people, of all the, all the soul winning that we do, all the doors that we knock on, do you know how many people are actually going to sacrifice afterwards? Well, look at, look at the Bible's examples. One of ten come back to thank Jesus. And this is all throughout the Bible, where the majority go astray. The majority stop following God, even if they do keep his commandments for a, for a period of time. I mean, even look at this example. The entire world is not serving God. There are other people saved as far as spiritually saved. You know, you can see that from the Bible. But you can see that the whole world went astray. So don't become, you know, discouraged when you look around and the church growth is slow. If you look at a lot of, you know, churches that became great churches, their church growth was slow for a long period of time. Right? And we just started in March, so the church growth is going to be slow. But let me say this. God commands 
the church to be built. God commands people to go soul winning. God commands people to go out and invite them in. God commands you to go out and teach and to preach. All of these different things, right? And, and to, to establish churches, all of these things. But it's not going to happen unless we actually go out and do it. God commanded Noah to build the ark. But the, the ark would not have been built unless Noah built it. God commanded Moses to build the tabernacle and to fashion it after what he showed him in the mount. But the, but the, the, the ark, the tabernacle, none of that would have been built unless Mo, Moses would have built it. Nothing gets done without hard work. Right. Nothing. Nothing. I don't know if people expect just to, you start up a church and you got, you know, 70 people added unto the church in, you know, three weeks. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. I mean, you have examples in the Bible when the apostles are going forth and they're performing miracles and things like that before people. And they're preaching unto the Jews at that time. But look around in the United States of America. Look around at the world today. And, and the world is getting more and more sinful. They're getting further away from any sort of righteousness, just like the Bible prophesies. And it's to be expected that it's even harder to get people to come to church, especially in modern day United States of America, where people are just watching, you know, just the, the worst filth. They're just desensitized to everything. And they live just these complacent lives where it's just like every day they do the same thing, just sitting on the couch. They go to work all the time. They just sit on the couch and watch TV. Well, they don't want to miss you know, their television show. They, they, they're, they're, they're so disinterested in anything that has to do with something spiritual. Because the world's becoming a more sinful, wicked place, of course, that's a big part of it. But because also that the United States is just has everyone desensitized to everything. Like nothing. They're not interested in doing anything. They're just a bunch of numb robots walking around. All right. So this is to be expected, but do you know what? This is the point of everything that I've been saying for the past few minutes. So if you glazed over, this is going to make no sense to you. Do you, you, you know what that means that you have to do? Work even harder. Amen. That's what that means that you have to do. You don't give up and say, this is just too hard to build the church. No, you know what? You just need to work harder. That's what you need to do. Amen. You know what? It might be a little bit harder to build the ark, but you need to build it anyways. It might be a little bit harder to build the tabernacle. To build, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, the different Ark I'm talking about now. But you know what? Then you need to work a little bit harder. That's what you need to do. You don't give up. You don't give up on God. God commanded you. You know what you need to do? You need to build the altar. And you need to keep sacrificing. That's your way of sacrificing to God for the rest of your life. You say, why? Because it's your reasonable service. Amen. Not for me. Not for your mom. Not for your dad. Not for anyone. But for God. It's your reasonable service for what God did for you and what he saved you from. God saved us from a burning eternal fire. It's, it's very small. That's, you know, it's, I mean, it can't even be explained how minute your service is compared to that. Amen. So, you know what you need to do? You need to dedicate your entire life to Jesus. Amen. To serving Him all the time, every day, constantly, building an altar every day. Decide tomorrow when you wake up, I'm going to build an altar today. I'm going to build numerous altars today. I'm going to read my Bible every chance that I get. If I get a break at work, I'm going to try to just memorize Scripture. If I get a break at home, whatever you're doing, memorize Scripture. Pray to God. These are things that are neglected in the Christian life, in the Christian walk. Build an altar. I want to be like a Noah. Like we were talking about earlier, I don't want to be like all these Christians that are just like happy that they're just an average Christian and not that. I'm just not that smart, but I love Jesus. No, I want to be wise like Solomon and love Jesus. Amen. I want to do great works for God and love Jesus. You know, I want to just, I want to build, I want to build a church here. I want to build a, something great for God. I want to do something great for Him. Not for me, not for you, but for God and what he's done for me in my life. And I can never pay him back. It doesn't matter the amount of works that we ever did in Jacksonville. You would never be able to pay God back for what we did, for what he did for us. Right. Look at uh, verse number 21. It says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I have done. Now, one of the greatest proofs that the Bible is the Word of God, and it's not a book just written, written by man. This is the greatest proof to, to me, that is, is that the Bible is a book 
that was pinned down by man. That is true, of course. Man pinned the Bible down. God, of course, you know, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The words were inspired and they were God's words. Man pinned all of these words down. All of them. But you know what? It is the, it is the most dim view of man that has ever been pinned down. That has ever, you know, has ever been written down. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is just downing man in many ways. It is. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is just talking about how sinful and wicked man is. Right. Just begin right there in Genesis chapter number 1. Shortly thereafter you have, man's not good enough, they fall, they eat of the fruit. Right after that you have, the, the, you know, there's four people in the earth and one of them kills another. I mean, goodness sakes, there's only four people there. You know, then you go on and, you, you know, you get just a few chapters into the Bible in Genesis chapter number 6, and God's like, you guys are stinking wicked. I'm doing away with the whole earth. You continue on, and what do you have? Israel. What do they do? Fail. One time after the next, after the next, after the next, the judges come, they fail. It, the, the book of Judges is just like failure, and then God delivers them. Failure, and God delivers them. It doesn't take, or if you add up the numbers, it's only 400 years. I mean, look at how many times that they're like going into slavery, of you know, the Philistines, and all these different types of things. You know what the book, you know what the, the, one of the greatest proofs of the Bible is? Is that if it was written by man, man would not sit down and say, like, look there, Genesis chapter number 8. I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. And then it says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. A man sat down and wrote that down. He's not, he's talking about man. He's talking about himself. You understand what I'm saying? Ezekiel sat down and he wrote down the, the word, speaking from the perspective of God, that God sought for a man to stand in the gap, and then Ezekiel wrote this, and found none. You know who that includes? Ezekiel. Isaiah, you know, sat down and wrote down the words that all their righteousnesses were as filthy rags. You know, Paul sat down and wrote, there is none righteous, no, not one. You, just all throughout the Bible, just the condemnation and the punishment of man. And then you have in Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 9, where the Bible talks about how the heart of man is, is, uh, is, desperate, is wicked, desperately wicked. Who can know it, I think the Bible says. You know, so it's, you, know, you have every single person in the Bible basically just like downing man. I would man sit down. You look at all these other religions and what do they tell you how you're going to get to heaven? By being a good person. So what do they think about man? That he's a good person. You know what the Bible says? You're wicked. Right. And you deserve to burn in hell. But because I'm a good God, I'm going to come down and save you. Man. That's because it's written from God's perspective. Amen. All right. That's all right. actually the greatest proof to the Bible that there is. I believe that. I mean, you have the power of God's word. Let me say one of the greatest proofs. That's one of the greatest proofs. One of the greatest. I'm top three at least. If you were to sit down and really put these out. But it's top three at least of one of the greatest proofs of the Bible is the perspective that the Bible takes of man. The perception of man from the author of the Bible. Which is pinned down by man. And then God's just continually the whole book. They're just wicked. I had to destroy them because they're wicked, because they're evil. Just can look, go through and read Romans chapter number three. Romans chapter number three is just like, you know, their mouths full of the poison of ass. You know, they're just, they're just, you know, describing just the wickedness, how their their feet are swift to shed blood. Just talking about mankind in general. Man would not sit down and write that. Man would sit down and say, I'm good at heart. How many, you know, why does the majority when you knock on the door, how are you gonna get to heaven? By being a good person. The majority of people think they're good. Right. And don't fool yourself in here because you got a tie on and you took a shower tonight. You're just as wicked as all the people in the Bible. Seriously, right. I'm not right. kidding. That's right. You're Amen. nothing. You're a, you are a wicked person too. Right. As far as your righteousness is, they're, they are just as wicked and just as dirty and just as filthy as the Israelites when, when Isaiah was standing there preaching before them. And chances and odds are that if you were a part of Israel when Ezekiel wrote the book of Ezekiel, you would have been not a person that would, that would equal up to what God needed to. He still would have wrote those words. You think, oh, you know, if I would have been there. No, you wouldn't have. He would have still wrote the same words. I sought for a man to stand in the gap and found none. Everybody in here 
we're, you know, we're all, we all have the same flesh. We're all, mankind is all of the same in it, and we're a bunch of sinners. And you need to just face the fact. And you know what? If you start thinking too highly of yourself, you'll cause yourself to fall. That's what you need to understand is that you, that you are a sinner. And that you are capable of the things. David, who's a man after God's own heart, the, you know, talks about details, you know, very, very uh, grievous sins that he commits. Adultery and murder. And you're going to say, oh, I would never do that. You better not have that kind of attitude. Amen. Or what you'll, what you'll fall faster into that sin than he did is what will happen. Amen. You know, the Bible talks, therefore, if a man thinketh that he standeth, let him take heed lest he fall. Right. I, I butchered that verse. But, you know, obviously you got the point of it. If you think that you stand, you better take heed. You better, you know, you know, take the warning and understand that, that, you know, if you are standing, it's by His grace and it's by His commandments. And it's only because He's giving you light and helping you and giving you grace. Because Amen. your nature is sinful and your nature is wicked. And when you look at these pagan countries, these, these, uh, all of these countries that, that just reject God entirely, these countries like Russia... In the Soviet Union, that was an atheistic nation at that time. That's what was going on. Was after the, you know, the booming of evolution, you know what happens when they reject God? That's what happens to a nation without God. And the only reason why, you know, the United States of America and many other countries that exist till, still to this day, they're able to be more civilized, is because they have the Bible. And when they throw out the Bible, they become. You, you really start to see that the imagination of man's heart is just evil from his youth continually. Think about that. Continually. And we have to understand also, we're getting closer to the end, like I had mentioned earlier. So it's going to be very similar to the time of Noah, where the world is so wicked to where God is going to destroy the earth again. Now, what's interesting about this verse, I'm going to wrap up right now. What's interesting about this, earth, about this verse is that he says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So notice what he says there at the end. I'm not going to do it as I have done. But is God going to smite every living thing again? Yeah. He is. Right. But he's not going to do it by water. Mm -hmm. So there's a little caveat right there. There's a, right, a disclaimer, if you will. He's going to do it by fire right. when, when he comes back. He's going to destroy the earth again. God is not different. People, you know, people today, they liberalize and they... You know, they think that God is just, you know, he's just all up. The same God that destroyed every living thing with water is going to destroy practically every living thing with fire. Right. right. The same punish, the same type of punishment that he used and the same manner in which he poured it out to just destroy everything with water, that same God is the same <laughs> yesterday, today, and forever, and he's going to destroy it with fire. He's not changing and he wants to make sure you understand that, that it was him in Genesis 6. That's why he says, I even I. Because it's him. It's not somebody else. He, you know, he wants to make sure he takes credit for this. I'm, I'm going to destroy this place, and I want to make sure you know who did it. And he says, the Lord, Jehovah. That just expresses his greatness and his power. Amen. Man. You know, I don't look down on God's judgment. I magnify God's judgment. Amen. That makes him great to me. Right. That he's able to just, all the power and the, and he takes everything into his hand. His justice, he should be, he should be praised for. Amen. When the world becomes wicked and evil and God is willing to stand up and punish the evildoers, I'm happy about that. Yeah. I'm happy about that, and you should be too. That's the attitude that we should have. I will glorify him and praise him when he brings punishment and when he brings justice upon the wicked. Amen. And, we, and everyone should. You're going to glorify whether you want to or not because you're going to sing the song of Moses. In Revelation 14, if you're saved, you're going to be in heaven. It tells them they're singing the song of Moses and they're glorifying him. Why? That's right when the seven, uh, the seven last plagues are being brought out. And they're praising him and honoring him and he's getting ready to just pour out his last judgments upon the earth. We should magnify God's judgments and not be afraid of God's judgments. The same God yesterday, today, and forever, the same God that destroyed the earth with water will one day destroy the earth with Fire. Verse number 22 debunks global warming. We'll, we'll end on this verse here. Read verse number 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter. Look at this. And day and night shall not cease. So notice the seasonal patterns 
will remain the same while the earth remains. You notice that? They're, they're not changing. They're not going anywhere. The seasonal patterns will continue. And seed time and harvest. And then he says this, and cold and heat. Global warming is a sham. I believe right. God. I don't believe man science. They're continually wrong about everything. And then people just con they, they keep putting their, you know, all, you know their, their, their trust in man. You know, we shouldn't be trusting in man. We should be trusting in the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for being a just and righteous God. We thank you for your word, dear Lord, and all the warnings that you give, give us. We, we thank you, dear Lord, for the instructions and the, uh, and, uh, the introspect that you give on, on ourselves, dear Lord, so that we know uh, what condition that our heart is in and that it is evil, dear Lord, and that it's prone to sin. And uh, that actually gives us the opportunity, dear Lord, to take the correct precautions. Dear God, we thank you for that warning. We thank you for your word. We ask you that you would bless the Bible studies going forward in the book of Genesis. And that you would uh, be with the Ray family, dear Lord. And we, we thank you for our visitor tonight and be with her. And bless every other family here tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.